Hi, welcome back to our channel. Please like and subscribe for more classic TV and music content and please follow us on Twitter, Instagram and all our socials to interact with us. All links will be in the description below. Thanks and enjoy the video. I'm today, this time for the London programme where I'm sitting in just for tonight for Godfrey Hodgson. And as a change for me from macroeconomics and micropolitics, the London programme takes a look at London's rock music industry. But just to reassure the addicts, economics won't disappear completely. After all, London is one of the world's great rock music centres. And the recorded music industry is a multi-million pound affair with a solid export record. But essentially, tonight's report is about one man, Mickey Most, who pulls the strings behind the scenes, and about one group, Mud, whom he's promoted and produced into prominence. In two weeks' time, their successful partnership splits up, and not apparently without some acrimony. The story behind that split shows a great deal about how London's music industry works. It is, of course, an industry that has traditionally flourished on our here-today, gone-tomorrow philosophy, as Mickey Most himself knows. With artists, you know, they go through changes, and... Uh, they, they, I don't know, they're hot for a certain period of time. Right now, we're, we're seeing the Bay City Rollers on every newspaper. Um, I know that in a year's time it won't be like that and in another uh, six months after that they'll be saying who are the basic and that is the fact of life. Do you think the basic rulers know that? Do they I, know I, that in a year's time people will be asking who are they? I don't know if they know it but they'll find out in a year's time because that's the way it is. The public do go on things for a certain period of time and once that time's over it's over mm. and there are other acts that can go on forever in this business. It depends on which road you travel along mm. when you first start. The beginning of that verse. Okay. Whether or not Most is right about the Bay City Rollers remains to be seen. Most himself, real name Michael Hayes, first started down the road as a pop singer, but soon found that that road wasn't going anywhere special. So 12 years ago, realizing that you lasted longer on the business side of show business, Mickey Most switched to the other side of the microphone. And the only thing I could do at that time was to play guitar and sing a few songs. So I, I made a living at, at doing that. and. Uh, I had about as much as I wanted to have of being on a stage and playing a guitar. I liked very much the other side of the business. I liked the idea of finding songs and finding artists and giving them the benefit of the experience that I'd, I'd had and try and create uh, the situation that I'm in today. I love rock and roll! Since then, most has built a profitable career, giving groups the benefit of his experience. His first success was with the animals. Let's hit the ground with the sound of the animals and, baby, let me take you home. The Animals first record uh, was top 20 record here, but the second record was the number one record everywhere, the House, the House of the Rising Sun. So it seemed that even in America they were buying English music that was really American music that uh, had been changed with a few pints of Newcastle Brownell into a, a sound that uh, had become at that time exclusively the British sound. suggested recording the house rises sound that they were a little bit against they felt it was slow and a bit long and but we they agreed to do it and then when we they came to London we did it in two takes I think about nine minutes it took an actual time to record the, the song um, and it uh, it seems that uh, now looking at it in retrospect that uh, absolutely nothing was done I didn't uh, do any mixing on it I didn't do any added effects on the record I just recorded it as if they were playing live and uh, it seemed enough after the animals most went on to even greater success with groups like Herman's Hermits and folk singers like Donovan with the animals it was to capture the rawness and that's what it was with Herman's Hermits or acts that I, I recorded after that period um, they needed a catchy tune, so it was a different story. I had to go around finding catchy tunes and putting catchy arrangements together. Uh, then, with, throughout my time with Donovan, it was trying to find a basis where folk music would be would, would sound right. You know, the, would, the arrangements for folk music would sound believable and wouldn't sound contrived, and that's difficult. Uh, so, I think with each art artist, you have to wear a different cap. While some of these artists that most produced during the past decade are still around, making a living in show business. 
Few are still making hit singles, as most is, and even fewer are millionaires, as most most certainly is. Mickey Most's outstanding talent has been to anticipate and to exploit changes in public taste for pop music. Indeed, sometimes to create a new taste himself. His business rolls, uh, revolves around his record company, Rack Records. But Mickey Most has a finger in many pies. He discovers new groups. After all, he's on the New Faces program each week and can provide them with managers, find them songwriters, produce and promote them, and generally turn them into hit parade personalities. One of his most recent successes has been Mud. All my life I've been awake. Tonight there'll be no... Mud were a group of South London boys from Mitcham who'd been around since 1968. They'd spent five years playing in dance halls, rocking men's clubs, nightclubs and the occasional tour abroad. They'd scarcely been noticed and they'd scarcely had a high time out of it. Dave Mount, their drummer. The, we were very fortunate because we all lived in London and we all lived with our parents. And so consequently we didn't have the problems of finding rent. Uh, a living wage is, is a, a, it depends on your standard of living. Uh, we didn't make a lot of money. I mean, we, we managed to eat. I mean, my parents wouldn't have let me carry on had I not been able to support myself. But obviously, th there's that sort of invisible support behind you by the fact that you can always go in and eat. You know, they're not going to throw you out on the street. <laughs> In 1972, Mud were just one of many groups playing at the most fashionable of the West End rock night spots. There, Mickey Most saw them for the first time. Lead singer Les Gray explains. Uh, well, we first met Mickey a long, long time before we actually signed with uh, Chinny Chap and with Rack um, at the Revolution Club in London. Uh, we were playing there on a just a um, sort of dancing spot for about 15 quid or something. And the birds, the yeah, right, right. And the waitresses were, were driving home in Mark 10 Jags, and we were going home in a, in a sort of transit, not even a transit, I think, I think a comma sort of truck. The first thing Mickey Most did for Mud was to introduce them to his songwriting friends, Nicky Chin and Mike Chapman. Chin and Chapman were themselves most discoveries from a couple of years before. Nicky Chin. Uh, I, I first met Mickey for about 30 seconds at one of these uh, record receptions. I think they're about one a day uh, in the record business, and uh, we, we try to avoid them basically now. But in those days, of course, they were an entree, and any that one could even get invited to was a big deal, uh, or gatecrash for that matter. Um, and someone pointed Mickey Most out to me, and I said, well, I want to meet him because Mickey then, and this is going back uh, sort of four and a half years, uh, had the reputation, as he probably still has today, of the man uh, in the business. You know, if you were involved with Mickey Most, you had a much better shot uh, than if you weren't. The Suite, the group that Chapman and Chin first wrote for. The two songwriters went from success to success with Most's backing and largely using Most's record company, Rack. The next big name was Susie Quattro. Chin and Chapman founded their own company, Chinny Chap Limited, and turned themselves into something of a song factory. Essentially, the Chinny Chap sound appealed to a pre-teenage audience who had never known the rock and roll of the 1950s. But they also attracted the adults who had grown up with it and had perhaps forgotten it. In 1973, mud seemed to Mickey Most to be good material for processing through the Chinny Chap machine. No, they have energy. They had energy in their spot. I guess they still have energy. And that sort of energy is something that young people can recognize. Mm. They had that when I, when I first saw them. Um, and I suggested that uh, they should record for us under the guidance of Nicky Chin and Mike Chapman. And uh, at that time, Nicky and Mike were very uh, involved with Sweet, and Sweet were high in the charts, so their, their songwriting was successful, so there's no reason why they shouldn't have used their own songs, you know, Nicky and Mike's songs. And it, the first couple of records were to find a direction for the band. And it wasn't until Dynamite, I think, which was their third record, that we started to get a direction in the rock and roll thing with the, you know, the old-fashioned, uh, well, the 50s look, yeah. and then Tiger Feet and so on. Um, 
but uh, they, the, the reason why they were used is because basically they had there was something about the way they were and the way they looked which appealed they had a sort of a working class hero appeal mm. they weren't trying to be overdressed or trying to be on a sex kick or something they were fun and I think fun it was necessary in 73 and is still necessary in 75. You see, that's the point I'm trying to make. They, they or I mean, perhaps you still disagree with it, they had something, but you, you really knew what you wanted and you molded them into what you wanted, a working class hero image, whatever. Yeah, but you they, had, they had it anyway. I mean, they looked like that. I mean, if they were looking like, uh, I don't know, looking like uh, with, the, uh, with the good girl look and all that, you know, like David Bowie, then I say, no, that wouldn't be no, no good for what I want. But they already had that sort of South London, rough and ready sort of thing about them. So it was just a question of trimming the hedge and making it to the shape that you want. We were sort of fairly impressed with them. They weren't amazing. There wasn't something that leapt out and said, this is the next Beatles. But there was something there that said they could be, uh, to use a corny phrase, pop stars. There was a certain magic, uh, a certain warmth in the act, actually. Most and Chin couldn't turn mud into stars overnight. They had to work at it. Interestingly enough, despite Chin's assessment of their musical abilities, this meant not letting mud play on their first two records. No, we didn't play on those two. Oh, well, but what? they were the least successful of all our records, which uh, seems, suggests something, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, it does suggest something. Were these played on by session musicians? Uh, the backing tracks, yeah. I mean, obviously we sang on them. But I think that's... Um, that, uh, it's not so common now in the business, but at that time it was a very common thing, uh, with studio time being so expensive. And there wasn't a lot of connection with uh, groups, with the record companies and the, and the people. And they weren't sure of the capabilities of the groups and the temperament of the groups which is very important because uh, if you're paying I don't know, 60 quid an hour in a recording studio you don't want some guy saying oh I don't want to play it this way and walking out which a session musician will walk in one of those early half mud recordings was Moonshine Sally which has just been released by Mickey Most last week so it can't have been so bad after all Moonshine Sally but after that, Mud began to actually play on their records, and their first attempt was a hit, Dynamite. A succession of Chin and Chapman hits followed, well-constructed echoes of the heavy rock of the 1950s. It was a brilliant combination. Mud's South London aggressive energy, the songwriting abilities of Chin and Chapman, and the production and promotion skills of Mickey Most. The combination produced ten hits in the past two years. Four of them, number ones. So, Mud became famous. But did they become rich? And indeed, just who deserves the greatest credit, and so the greatest reward, for their success? Mud themselves as the entertainers, or most and chinny chap who produced and who wrote their material. London's music industry has traditionally rewarded producers and promoters, promoters rather more than the musicians. Let's just see exactly who does what, and who earns what, in the pop music world. Records are actually manufactured and distributed by four main companies in Britain. Giant ledger conglomerates like EMI were by far the biggest chunk of the market, together with Decker, Philips and Pi. The rest are compilation companies like KTEL. The manufacturers had a turnover of £187 million in Britain alone last year and earned £20 million in overseas royalties. The major companies not only manufacture and distribute their own labels, but those of other independent record companies, like Mickey Most's company, Rack, which is handled by EMI. Is it? So I don't look all sort of like a goldfish, do I? No, not really. No. Most works closely with EMI. He can, for instance, negotiate large advances from EMI against the royalties a group may earn for Rack when he starts them on their way. Yeah, me! EMI and most can afford to do this because when a record is sold, most of the money it earns goes to people other than the musicians who actually sing and play on it. I love rock and roll! This single record sells in the shops for 55 pence. Just over 3 pence goes to the music publishers for their copyright. There's 4 pence for VAT. 
The musicians get altogether five and a half pence, while the dealer gets more than 20 pence. And the major share, 21 pence, goes back to the record company and the manufacturer, who may be different people. So the musicians only get five and a half pence from each record, and much of that goes to other people, as we can see from the fictional career of some imaginary Spiggy Topes. Spiggy is about to make the leap from being a full-time motor fitter's apprentice and part-time guitarist to a full-time musician. The pop promoter, who spotted Spiggy's talent, signs him with a three-year contract for £30 a week. The rest of his earnings go elsewhere. The manager takes 30% of all Spiggy's earnings. His agent will take 10% of the money from his live tours. The promoter takes 5% of his record deal and another 5% of all earnings for publicizing him. Up to a third of Spiggy's income will have to go in repayments on the expensive musical equipment. Finally, Spiggy has to cover his substantial touring expenses. All this leaves him in his early days with little more than a subsistence income. Yeah, I mean, we live in a capitalist world. I mean, you just have to say to yourself, you need a fair return for your investment, and that's really judging what is fair. Yeah. And, you know, making those judgments, it's not necessary uh, to, to consider the, only the artist. You have to consider the rising cost of administration and the rising cost of the plastic to make the records and the recordings and the tape mm -hmm. and the, the, the increase in taxation that, come, that comes about all the time. So you have to try and build that in. Well, that's how the industry basically organizes itself. Clearly, the rock groups are, at least for the early days of their careers, very much at the bottom of the pile. And many groups never have careers that get beyond that early days stage. Mud were very much in this pattern when they signed up with Most and Chin and Chap Limited. Much of the money they earned went either to Most or Chin and Chapman. Drummer, Dave Mount. We were fully aware. We, we did go to a solicitor, and the solicitor told us all the problems of that contract. And we decided to take that because I think Nicky's words were, um, would you rather have 4% of four percent of something or 10% of nothing? I think, but I mean, we were, we were aware of what we were doing. I mean, it's, uh, we'd been around long enough not to sort of think, aha, you know, this is, this is the, uh, the be all and end all. But we, it, for us, it was a means to an end. Um, with the mud. mud had a manager to sort this deal out with Chin, Chapman and Most, Barry Dunning, a man introduced to them by Chapman and Chin, but a man who eventually was to lead them into their break with a successful rock production team. Dunning recognises that their early deal was not the most equitable contract in the world. In retrospect, it may not have been the fairest contract, but at the time, um, if I quote Nick Chin, it was the only contract they could get. Um, fair dues, you know. I mean, it wasn't a rip-off by any stretch of the imaginations. It made them stars, you know. What, what price to make someone a star? Um, it didn't make them any appreciable sums of money. The money's all gone elsewhere. A production contract basically involves them in being exclusively produced, uh, in this case, uh, by us. Um, which means, obviously, we make the records, we choose the songs. In our particular case, because we were songwriters, uh, we always wrote the songs. Although this is not part of a production agreement that says we exclusively must write. Uh, th there is no agreement that I know of that, that could state that, because if we dry up as producers and having bound them to a contract, it's our job to go out and find the right song if we can't write it. Uh, but that's what it involves them in an exclusive production agreement. And in this case, it was a three-year agreement. So, out of the first two years that Mud were with Most and Chinny Chap, the year, figures for last year aren't yet available, Most, Chin and Chapman took between them at least half a million pounds, and Mud grossed 120,000 pounds. Most of that went on expenses, and the musicians have actually had only 70 pounds a week to take home. <laughs> Not surprisingly, perhaps, Mudd became a little dissatisfied with such a relatively modest return. A couple of months ago, they tried to negotiate a new deal with Chinny Chap, but failed. In two weeks' time, the formal contract between Mudd and their rock mentors expires. Mudd have chosen to go it alone. Well, we will be leaving Chinny Chap on, on the 1st of July, um, for various reasons. Um, one, which we thought, if we sign with them for another three years, they've 
now got to the situation where they're immensely wealthy. Or we imagine they're wealthy. I mean, <laughs> we, you know, I don't exactly know their bank balance. But, uh, um, and we thought that maybe the interest would go within the next year, which would leave us out in the cold. Um, and so we thought we would take our future in our own hands and see what happens from there. We are taking a, a, a gamble now, but it, it's a gamble and, it, uh, you know, our destiny is in our own hands. So it's now down to us. I think it was definitely influenced by management because if the management hadn't acted in that particular way, I don't think the group and Chini Chat would ever have split because we were on a winning streak with them. And I think in any business, let alone the music business, you don't break winning formulas if you can help it. Uh, I think they've probably made a mistake. Everybody makes a mistake sometimes in their life. I think they've made theirs. But the split with Kinney Chap was not Mudd's only gamble. Record tycoon Mickey Most wasn't pleased with the ditching of his friends and Mudd's contract with record company Rack was also not renewed. Mudd have now gone to Phillips. Gunning says the split with Most was because Most wanted to contract all four individual musicians separately as well as jointly as the group Mudd, which he thought was unfair. One of the factors of changing the uh, record company was very, very much related to the fact that I couldn't get on renegotiating the contract with Mickey Most um, anything but a jointly and severally agreement in as much as he wanted them individually as well as a group under the name of Mud, And this was unacceptable because in three years' time, hopefully the four will be um, established as individuals in their own right. I mean, the lead guitar player might be doing classical records and it hardly seems right that a company marketing pop product is the right company to market. Um, classical record. Dave Mount might be doing stand-up comedy. I mean, goodness no one knows what's going to happen, you know. And uh, the contract we got elsewhere was just as mud as a group. And the four individuals are free to negotiate their own individual contracts should that, you know, situation develop in the future. Mud's deal with Phillips is short term, which is clearly not so secure as their former three-year agreement but they will get a far larger percentage of their record earnings. The split with most was not without some bitterness. So when the split became public knowledge, how did this affect your standing with rap records? <laughs> uh, I, I think the graffiti on the posters in their office says a lot. I'm not sure. Um, we, we, we found it very difficult. I mean, um, to communicate, uh, you know, I think they, they weren't very pleased about the situation, to say the least. They didn't stay with us for reasons which I really have not discovered. Uh, they seem to think it was financial. In other words, they feel they could get a better deal with another record company. Mm. And that is their, their liberty. I mean, if they, if they feel that, that's okay. Um, the price was too expensive for us, and we said we pass. So Mud's future is in their own hands now. Two weeks ago they flew to Dublin to premiere a film to celebrate being at the top of the Irish hit parade and to give a concert. You have to go to the people live and play live. You can't just um, make records and sell records. And it's a theory that we have and we believe in it, we've always believed in it. Live concerts are very much part of Mud's professional routine, though they're rarely profitable. No money. The roadies were setting up the evening concert. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. While the rock stars were given the red carpet treatment from showbiz promoters and disc jockey priests. You're not a pop freak, are you? I am, yes. I do a lot of <laughs> I do my preaching through the records.